Hello, we're back. It's now episode two of Sprinkler Talk from Project Fire. This is our podcast we're putting together to talk about different aspects of the fire sprinkler industry, uh, particularly sprinklers, of course, because that, that's our specialism. Uh, today, we've got Jake Sturgis joining us, uh, who is going to be talking about fire signalling. So how do we get signals from our sprinkler equipment um, what do we kind of pass them on to and then what happens in terms of the, the wider environment of uh, fire and fault signals within a building. So yeah, Jake, thanks for joining us today. Um, so yeah, you've been working at Project Fire and, and you're a qualified electrician? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I'm a fully qualified electrician. Um, got more of a total electrical engineer's role now. Um, I initially did an apprenticeship at Project Fire. Um, three or four years. I then went and worked in the automation industry for, for a small time um, and then I've been back at Project Fire now for a while so I've got sort of over 10 years experience in total. And uh, today's topic is all about fire signalling and monitoring uh, and obviously being an electrician uh, by background I mean that, that's something that's very much uh, in, in your area isn't it? Yeah that's right yeah yeah that's my area. So um, what, what kind of things do we have in the sprinkler industry which is going to be generating fire signals for the, um, for buildings? Um, so fire signals are generally sent from flow switches or pressure switches. So obviously if a sprinkler head goes off, that's going to create a flow um, that will activate a paddle, set off a flow switch, and then again a drop in pressure. Um, and then all the things you monitor for faults or sort of stuff like in the pump house and uh, monitored valves, stuff like that. So we've got, we've got fire and we've got fault signals. Um, I guess that's very similar to uh, fire detection panels as well. They're, they're doing the same kind of thing, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. So an example on a fire detection panel, an example of a fire signal would be a smoke detector, mm. heat detector or a manual call point. An example of a fault would be if um, sort of there was damage to the hardware, if someone wants to damage a cable. Um, on a sprinkler system, um, you know, fire fire so a fire signal would be a press switch or a flow switch, as I've just said, um, but a fault could, again, be a damage to the hardware, or it could also be um, something like a tank level in the pump house or yeah, a monitor yeah. valve being closed in the pump house, low battery level, anything like that, it's going to recognise that as a fault signal, not a fire signal. That's right. I mean, there's, there's, there's quite a lot, aren't there, of, of different types of signals that we're generating. Um, and the, the sprinkler signals and the fire and fault signals from the detection panels, they're kind of going to get merged together at some point, aren't they, um, by a, a larger uh, panel or, or device. I guess that depends on the, on the type of building and, and project that we're working on. Yeah, that's right. It depends what's sort of been specified. Normally you have one fire alarm panel um, that's sort of dedicated to the signals from the sprinkler system mm. um, and that then relays or, you know, um, goes to a, a separate panel which is looking at the bigger picture as well as all the detection in the building. So let, let's talk about monitoring then, that to start with. That, that's a, um, a, looking at um, fault signals generally, isn't it, uh, for monitoring. So we're talking about a, like a monitored valve, a butterfly valve. Uh, we want to monitor it to be uh, normally in the open position. And we do that through the, the use of, of cables. Um, so what, what's actually going on there? How, how are we actually monitoring the, the valve? That's right. So um, yeah, you, you have valves in open and closed state. Um, you know, on a sprinkler system, 90% of your valves are going to be open. Yeah. You're going to have a couple that are closed on such and bypass lines and things yeah, like that. Yeah. But essentially, you're going to wire that valve so that it's in its healthy position, which is open, is going to give you a signal. And then if you obviously change the state of that valve, it's then going to give you a fault signal. And that's it, it's a monitored line, isn't it? So we use some resistors to kind of tell the difference between an actual problem well we know when it's closed and when we've lost the signal that that's right yeah so about when i say about normally open and normally closed signals so you've got common normally open normally closed and mm. um, that's essentially it's like a make signal or a break signal and, and there's multiple ways to do this but how we monitor it on our addressable system is via the use of end of line resistors so essentially what we do um, electricity will always take the path of lowest resistance so we wire, if you imagine you've got an output and an input, which are your two wires going to your monitor valve, we'll output, say, 5 volts, and we'll have a resistor in line. So that resistor in line, we use a 10K resistor. Mm. We then wire the um, monitor valve through the normally closed terminals and then back to our, our panel. So essentially, because that's a closed signal, we will, we will read 10K. But what we then do is we wire across the two terminals, so across the common and the normally closed, mm. we w wire a 4.7k ohm resistor. Right. Um, because electricity always takes a path of quickest resistance, it will flow through the normally closed switch. 
But if that switch then opens, it can no longer flow through the switch. Yeah. It will then flow across that resistor. So we've already got the 10K, now we've got the 4.7. So we're then gonna read on our input 14.7. So in this situation, if you read in 10K, it's healthy. If you read in 14.7, you've got a fire. But if you read anything else, so let's say someone hits the cable with a forklift, mm -hmm. you're gonna read zero. Um, and that's gonna see fault, not fire. So the reason we use end of line resistors is so that if someone was to damage a cable, it wouldn't recognize that as a fire, it would recognize it as a fault. Yes. And then also, so that, you know, it's monitoring this resistance constantly. So if somebody does damage a cable, you're gonna know about it, you've yes. got to go and investigate it, it can't, it got, someone can't damage a cable and then there'd be a fire and someone not know about it. Exactly, it, it seems to me you, you, you would have a choice between having um, someone damaging the cable and not knowing about it, which is bad, or damaging a cable and that generating a fire signal. And yeah. the false evacuation. So yeah, either is, is not good, is it? So yeah, exactly. yeah, the, the way that we do it, we can we can tell the difference between the two. That's right. Yeah, and as I say, different manufacturers use sort of different arrangements, but it's all a very similar concept. We sort of monitor resistors to to achieve these signals. And um, this is why, well, on a monitor valve, we've got all the the wires coming out. That is to uh, provide that that monitoring capability. But, but why are there so many wires? I mean, there, there's, there's at least 10 <laughs> yeah. wires, it seems to me. So different panels and different sort of brands and manufacturers, they will specify sort of different things, so sort of different signals. So the manufacturers of the valve have to be quite universal. Mm -hmm. So normally when you look at a valve, you've got a number of wires, and that would be because you've got a double pole switch, which means that you've got one switch that activates two sort of separate two sort of separate locations mm -hmm. so you can have one switch which will be activated when you open or close the valve but then that can you can then send that signal to two separate places so essentially yeah. you can monitor it in from one panel and then another panel um, so those wires you'll have common normally open and normally closed depending on whether you've got your make or your break signals so that's your six wires you've then got a ground which is seven mm -hmm. um, and then commonly as well panel um, valves will have additional wires sort of piggybacked off the wires that are already there that you can wire resistors to all that is is that they're there for the same purpose but it just means that you've sort of got less bulk in your wiring so rather than wiring resistors and wires into the same terminals you can wire your resistors to one and your wires to another yeah good that makes sense um <laughs> let's talk about the the cables themselves so they're not um they're not electricity cables, are they? We, we, we're not got mains electricity flowing through there to, to actually provide that monitoring capability, are we? Yeah, so it's just low voltage signaling cable. So I mean, when we talk about mains in the UK, it's sort of 230 volts. Um, we do have a voltage in these cables, but it's, any, it's sort of anywhere between five and 12 volts normally. Again, it depends, but it's something like that. So we sort of don't see that as, as live voltage because, yeah. um, you know, 12 volts isn't enough to sort of penetrate human skin, so you wouldn't actually feel that. Um, but it is there is voltage there. Yes, that's right. I think it's it's yeah for the for the average person, it, it is useful to explain. Well, it it's it's not powered, but yeah, it, it kind of is, but just at a very very low level. That's right. Yeah, it's just low voltage signal cable. It's not sort of dangerous in any way. Uh, and what about the the protection? You know, I've heard this term FP two hundred. Um, that's a term that's explaining how it's protecting against fire? That's right, so the standards say that on um, fire detection or sprinkler system you have to use fireproof cabling. Mm. Um, so FP200 sort of does actually stand for FP is fireproof and then the 200 is two core cable normally, you normally have two core on earth. Um, so that cable will last for about an additional 30 minutes in the event of a fire um, as opposed to normal cable. Um, it's also screened, so if you notice inside, it's got that sort of a reflective mm. um, metallic sheathing. Um, that's that's to ground interference. Um, so your earth wire is obviously going to go to ground, um, and then if you have sort of high voltage cables running alongside mm. the Which signal might cables, do, and they might yeah. be the same cable train, might they? To do that yeah, too. so you normally have to have some sort of divider. Ah, okay. um, but yeah, essentially, if there's high voltage cables in the area, you've got. A risk of interference mm. so the reason we use that sheath is to sort of ground any interference and interference could mean false activations or just not not getting the signals through yeah yeah anything like that really yeah and it makes sense to have the the, the cables being fire resistant because of course in the that's what the whole system's for isn't it we are kind of expecting a fire and therefore we want some some fire resistance from the cables as well yeah that's right so um yeah essentially if it, if it was a fire in a building um, the most important thing is that your detection and your, your evacuation mm. system is active. 
So yeah, you have to use fireproof cabling to give you that additional protection. And there's lots of rules about you know, glands as well and, and how the boxes are and IP ratings and all that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. So again, with sprinklers, IP ratings for two things. I mean, obviously you've got the risk of water, um, but then also you've got the risk of um, you have to fire stop sort of all the, all the various different areas and, mm. and things like that as well. Yeah, yeah. No, fire stopping will definitely be a, a topic uh, <laughs> for, for the future. Yeah. Um, so what about responsibility then? And so uh, last week I was talking to, to Ben about a different... Um, parts of the kind of the process of, of construction and who's responsible for what. So in terms of um, the, the fire signals then, what does a sprinkler contractor generally do? And then what is then picked up by the electrical contractor or the fire alarm contractor or, or somebody else? Yeah, so uh, I mean, two jobs really seem to be the same, but sort of a, a general sense is that your sprinkler contractor will install, say your flow switches, your pressure switches, um, a lot of sprinkler companies use subcontractors to do their electrical work, some of their own in-house electricians, but it's mm -hmm. quite common they use subcontractors. Um, what they sometimes do is they sort of pre-wire the flow switches or the pressure switches, which is what you've called tails before. Mm -hmm. So you have like a, um, a short cable, let's say a couple of metres, sort of looped up coming out the flow switch. Um, the sprinkler contractor will be responsible for that. And then the fire alarm engineer can sort of look at the bigger picture um, later on. That can be taken back to to it like an IO unit. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes what a sprinkler contractor will specify is that you have to have an IO unit, so that's just like a small input output box which can be given an address and taken to a fire alarm panel. Mm -hmm. So they can specify that they say there has to be one of them on each floor and there has to be like a 13 amp fuse spur on each floor, for example, um, and then they can sort of take their signals from there then. That's right, yeah. I mean, I think what's, what's really important is that this is really clear in the the quotations and the yeah. sort of the documents isn't it because um sometimes things can happen you get onto site and it's like well i thought you were doing that and then, uh, yeah yeah no there's definitely a bit of that especially when um especially in this industry with the use of obviously various different companies and various subcontractors mm, yeah, there's yeah. definitely a bit of a bit some issues sometimes caused by who's responsible for what okay <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about um sort of complicated um sort of bigger buildings. I mean, that, that's where you, you'd often find uh, zone checks and zone check addressable. Yeah. Um, so what, what difference does that make in terms of the, the kind of the panels and the technology and, and things that are being used? So in a smaller building, let's say you know, really small, so like a house, mm -hmm. you'd normally have sort of a conventional fire alarm panel. Mm -hmm. So let's say in a house, you've got, I don't know, three or four smoke detectors, probably one upstairs, one downstairs, and one in your kitchen, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the conventional fire alarm panel, they would just be wired in series, so sort of like a daisy chain, so from the panel right, okay, to the yeah. one to the next to the next. Um, and then if any one of them activates, your panel's gonna say fire, but what it's not gonna say is which one's been activated, that, that's a conventional panel. Whereas an addressable panel, it's sort of in the name that you address the components. Mm -hmm. So with fire detection, normally an addressable panel, your smoke detectors would have dip switches, mm -hmm. so you can call them with the dip switches, sort of one, two, three, four, five. And then let's say that number five goes off, you can program that on your panel to say, you know, smoke detector in the basement's gone off, for example, you can give that a name. Um, and that's the same with sprinklers really. So our, our zone check addressable system, um, each zone is given an address, um, and then we know exactly where the fire or where the fault is, we get quite a detailed signal. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, I can imagine that the more complicated the building, that the fire strategy as a whole is going to get more complicated. Um, with, with some buildings, it's quite easy. Um, you just evacuate as soon as you can, nearest fire exit, and that's that. But other buildings, you're going to want to do uh, more sort of nuanced uh, evacuation, maybe a phased evacuation, or go and investigate. And yeah, but there's other systems at play, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. So obviously life's a lot easier when it's sort of just there's a fire evacuate. Yeah. But if there is a phase evacuation, I mean, we've done jobs in the past where what they've wanted to do is say, for example, you've got a high rise building and you've got a fire on floor three. Mm. They only want to evacuate, evacuate one above and one below. Yep. So when there's a, someone's detected in floor three, you would only evacuate um, two, three and four mm. um, and then sort of make a decision from there then. So um, yeah, when phase evacuation's in place, there's sort of mm. different ways of sending these signals then. Yeah, I mean, it can get really complicated, kind of like your hospitals, uh, shopping centres, airports. You know, we, we do not want to just evacuate straight away. <laughs> there, there's, there's other things kind of going in play. Uh, and this is a, a cause and effect system, is that right? That's right, yeah. So I suppose this, this gets to the sort of the grounds of where each job is very specific. So each mm. building is going to be, you're going to have a very specific strategy to that building. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, not, it's no, no job's the same, really, when you get into 
when you get into this. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about uh, zone check addressable, you, you mentioned that uh, earlier on. So um, just to, to kind of explain to everybody a little bit, uh, but zone check addressable is uh, it's a product that we make uh, as Project Fire, uh, and it's there to link with our zone checks uh, to do automated flow switch testing. So the the controller unit sends a signal to the IMM, the Intelligent Monitoring Module, which sends power to the pump, runs the pump, circulates the water, tests the flow switch. Uh, so it, it, it's a testing system, but it's also doing monitoring as well. So we're, we're taking a signal from the flow switch, which is looking out for signals during testing, which is a successful test, or signals outside of testing, which would then be a fire signal or fire condition. And uh, we're also monitoring the, um, the, the zone valves, the, the butterfly valves, uh, close to, to that zone as well. So yeah, that's a little bit about kind of what it does. Uh, Jake, my question to you is, um, how do we integrate that system into the wider strategy? You know, how do we link it to fire alarm panels or BMS systems, etc.? Yes, this, this can be done in multiple ways. Um, so our zone check adjustable controller has got basic fire and fault relays mm -hmm. so essentially nine times out of ten how it's done is the our controller will be mounted right next to a fire alarm panel mm -hmm. and essentially our system will get a fault uh, sorry a fire signal it will then say on our panel you know you've got a fire at three o'clock on zone three left staircase or something like that mm -hmm. um that signal then gets passed over to the fire alarm panel but because it's basic relays it will just say fire it won't say fire zone three because the panels are right next to each other, it's normally not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, we can also integrate, we work with some of these sort of leading fire alarm, uh, fire detection companies, so we can sort of link to various different fire alarm panels. Um, but another way of doing it would be if you need, let, let's say for example, you've got the adjustable controller in one room and then you've got a fire alarm panel in another. Mm -hmm. It might be in the building strategy or the specification that it has to say on both panels where the fire is. That's still achievable, it just might not be achievable with one cable, it might take a bit more wiring. Um, you can take a signal from each IMM. So the IMMs are sort of local control panel to the zone checks, um, stands for Intelligent Monitoring Module. Um, you can take a signal from each IMM, and that's very specific, that is because it's specific to that zone, so you can say this is in zone two, zone three, something like that. Yeah. Um, we actually offer another product as well called a UOM. So a UOM is a universal output module and it's essentially a box that goes in between our controller and the fire alarm panel and it's just a big bank of relays. So essentially we take one cable from our controller, it can then split that signal into sort of multiple fire and fault signals and that can then be, be used as like a universal way of speaking to different fire alarm panels. Because uh, that, that, that's what you do, isn't it? It's, uh, it's Project Fire, part of your job is doing commissioning of zone check addressable. So I guess you've seen lots of different setups you know, done in different ways. Uh, we, we've done shopping centres and hospitals, haven't we? And also yep. residential buildings. Uh, do you want to share a little bit about uh, commissioning of zone check addressable? Yeah, that's right. So we've done sort of a, a really wide range of projects. Um, so how the commissioning works is what we offer is when we sell a system, um, in the UK, we offer sort of one day's free assisted handover. So we'll sort of go with the with the customer to help hand the system over. Um, so we sell our we sell to our customer initially. Um, they install the zone checks, they install the IMMs, they install all the gear. Um, they normally have a go at commissioning the system themselves first. Um, that just means that they can iron out any problems just to make make sure that when we arrive on site, we yeah. can get the most out of that day. Um, and what we sort of do is, the first thing we'd do is we'd pick a percentage of the system. So let's say there's 20 zone checks, we'd pick a percentage of that, we'd view them zone checks, make sure everything's been wired properly, just make sure there's going to be no issues there. Um, the customer then would normally have a list of the IMMs. Um, so as I've mentioned, how our system is addressable is each IMM has got a specific serial number. So let's say that you've got 10 floors. You have to go to each one of them floors, have a look at the IMM, and it will say, I don't know, IMM 78, 79, something like that you would then make an Excel sheet based off them numbers and give them names. So we would say that IMM 78 is floor seven, for example. Mm. So we build that sort of, that, that um, spreadsheet. We then upload that to the controller. When the controller turns on, the first thing it does is look for the loop. Hopefully it finds that loop straight away if the loop's in wire correctly. Mm -hmm. um, 
we would then any, any faults that are on the system would then flag up so say for example somebody's wired a flow switch normally opens they're normally closed mm. the panel's going to say there's a fire because you've simulated a fire by doing that by wiring the flow switch off yes it. it's sort of always in fire and that's when right. it's triggered it'll be not a fire but just exactly, yeah or yeah. if maybe a valve is closed for example it's, true, you true. know yeah. little things like that so there's, there's, normally the panel comes on we make a little list of mm. the things to look at and then we just we just make our way through that list so if it says fire on floor four we'll go have a look at floor four normally there's you know a problem with the wiring something like that um, and then yeah once we've ironed out all the, all the issues and um, we then go back to the controller and we test each zone check one by one just make sure everything's working um, and yeah that's how, that's how we, we hand the system over then so it's a functioning system I mean one of the advantages of zone check addressable I feel is that having the screen uh, and actually having a, a custom name for each zone yeah. so rather than just calling it zone one zone two it, it doesn't really mean anything to, to the, um, the, the user of the building uh, it's better to actually call it something yeah. uh, so you can actually identify where it is um, but I know that some people prefer to have a you know a board you know a light board with all the different lights and things is that possible can we uh, make that work on, on a board from zone check addressable yeah, so we, we can send the signals. It wouldn't be on our panel, it'd be an additional panel. Mm. But yeah, we, we can send the signals capable of doing that. So sometimes it's a sort of a specified on site. You have to have an LED per zone. Yeah, um, yeah we, we can send the signals to function them LEDs from our system. Cool. And um, what about the, the future? I mean, um, I've seen on kind of trade shows and, and things in the industry about wireless technology, which you know, sounds quite exciting. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of cables, there's a lot of you know, connections to make around the building. So could we see wireless technology coming into fire sprinkler? I think it definitely will come in. I think we're a long way off just because it, it is slowly sort of making its way in now. Um, for fire detection, like smoke detectors, heat detectors, I think that's a little bit more straightforward just because the locations where you're going to have these smoke detectors, for example, you're more likely to have a good signal. I mean, sprinklers, quite a lot of the signals are going to be in the basement, in a pump house. Um, you're going to struggle to make them work wirelessly. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion as well, I also think that this wireless technology is a lot more beneficial for retrofitting, which is a smaller market. Because yeah. if you've got an existing building and you don't want to, you know, rip the building apart to run your wires, perfect. But quite often in the sprinkler industry, it's new, it's new buildings, new installations, um, and to be honest, running that cable is isn't that much of a problem, and it's also more beneficial to have the cable rather than using batteries and wireless signals and and stuff like that. So I think I think it will come, but I don't think it's uh, going to be any time too soon, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that in in sprinklers, we're always asking, well, what happens if you know what happens if we lose that power and we lose that signal yeah. and that gets damaged and there's a yeah. We've always got to consider all these things to make it as safe as possible. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I can't see it happening any time in the near future, no. to be honest. <laughs> and uh, I know one of the other things we're working on is uh, Zone Check Addressable 2. That's right, yeah. sort of an updated version. Uh, can you share anything about that? That's right, yeah. So our system now it is, it is reasonably old. It's, um, it's a little bit sort of outdated, but just with the newer technologies. Mm -hmm. So we're, of course, working on maximising them technologies with our newer system. So we're going to be able to do sort of features such as remote monitoring, you know, like activate zone, zone check tests from your phone, from your iPad, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And we're making good progress on the new system at the moment. And yeah, it's going to have a lot more, lot more capabilities and better use of modern technologies and stuff like that. Sounds exciting. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks so much for, for your time, Jake. Thanks for joining us. Um, again, I, I hope you found that interesting and useful. Um, I think that it is something which is um, definitely of interest to, to the sprinkler industry because, uh, like I say, you know, there's lots of engineers doing um, fire alarm stuff, but less engineers looking, focusing on the, the sprinkler side of, of those, on, those ideas. Uh, also, we're, later on in our series, we're going to be talking to uh, well, talking about the wider fire strategy. So obviously, there's a there's a much bigger picture of the overall fire strategy of a building. Uh, so sprinklers just forms you know a part of that, a segment of that. So yeah, that, that's coming up uh, to to watch as well. So yeah, thanks very much for, for joining us uh, today for uh, episode two of Sprinkler Talk podcast. Lots more episodes uh, coming up. So uh, yeah, do subscribe, um, do let us know any, any questions, and comments, suggestions. It'd be great to get some, some interaction uh, from, uh, from you and the industry uh, to let us know how we're getting on. But yeah, hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.